what I'm hearing you say is that you felt the temptation to go to Twitter. You recognized in real time that that was not actually what you were after, that it wasn't going to make you feel good. You asked yourself, what am I actually after? You determined it was connection. You gave yourself an alternative. You enacted, took action on that alternative. And then you went to bed and felt better about yourself. Like, that's a huge success. Yeah, yeah. So you guys thought I was just partying. You won. You <laughs> totally won. <laughs> all right, all right, Disco John. <laughs> I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. Welcome to the grand finale of the Offline Challenge. So after this intro, you'll hear Max and I recap our final challenge before Offline Chancellor Carolyn Dumphy returns to crown a champion. After that, you'll hear from our special guest, Catherine Price, a science journalist and ex-phone addict who wrote the book, How to Break Up with Your Phone. Catherine began rethinking her relationship with her phone in 2016, after realizing that her phone habit was interrupting time with her newborn daughter. Since then, her book has helped thousands break their phone addictions. We wanted to talk to Catherine to get her perspective on the offline challenge. But we also wanted to talk to Catherine about what comes next. How do we all maintain the progress we've made over the past month? And what should we do when we inevitably fall back into our phone addictions? She offers a more measured approach to breaking up with your phone, reminding us that the breakup isn't about what you lose, but about what spending less time on your phone can help you gain. First up, Max and I recap the challenge. All right, I am here with Max Fisher. Hey, pal. Uh, so far, uh, who's leading the offline challenge? Well, we're all winners here. We're, the okay, challenge. okay. So this is week five. Mm -hmm. This is the finale. Flown by. It's, yeah, it's, we're, we're in uh, purgatory time, here. Time, <laughs> oh, come on. Time flies when you're enlightened, you're yeah. connecting with your friends and your family, <laughs> you're not addicted to your phone. Or it's a nightmare from which you were just waiting to awake. You know, it's sort of a, this has been a slow burn, let me just say. <laughs> it's just like, they're like, yeah, it's fine. It's great. It's fun. I'm enlightened. And then by this week, I'm just like, give me my phone. <laughs> really? That's so funny. I feel like this week was the week when I was like, I'm just like soaring now. Yeah. I look, I, I don't even need the challenge. I'm just so happy not to have the phone. Uh, I, well, I, I would say that. Uh, I'm looking, and this is why it's going to be great to talk to um, Catherine Price after this. But mm -hmm. like, I'm looking for something sustainable. Sure. Yeah. That is like I, I'm looking not to um, like I used to feel bad every time I picked up the phone because I'm addicted and it makes you feel bad. I, and now it's like, oh, did I really need to do that, or am I going to lose this week's offline challenge? <laughs> like, I need that to go away. <laughs> yeah, the competitiveness as an element of stress yeah. is not, I think a little bit is helpful. I do like that we've done a like shock therapy, like put yeah. ourselves through like four or five like kind of crazy, chaotic, difficult weeks. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that anyone who wants to do a version of this for themselves, like find the sustainable version, find the like map for yourself, but like put yourself through a few weeks of like turmoil. And it's both like a little fun and I think it's a good way to just reset your relationship to the phone a little bit. Yeah, like on the way to the office just now, I... Did you send some tweets? No, no, that what, it, the opposite okay. is that like, I, I knew that we weren't counting, to, we don't never count today. So I could have just like been looking at the phone, but I, I, you know, I didn't look at it at all. And I didn't okay. look at it walking in and I was just okay. walking quietly and I didn't care. And I was like, okay, that's a good, like I, I've shifted behavior. You were feeling the, the desire not to be in your phone come from within rather than from the like not even not even a, I wasn't even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. That's what that's where I want to get to. Okay. Is that it yeah. wasn't yeah. even crossing my mind yeah. that I that I'm not looking at my phone or that I need mm -hmm. to look at my phone. It was just like I'm the walking. social accountability is important. I do yeah. find myself it's it's always a choice that I'm glad that I'm making in the moment. But when I'm like picking up my phone and thinking like, I, do I want to look at Twitter? Do I want to look at Instagram? Knowing that like it's going to punch up that screen time number and I'm going to have to tell mm. somebody about that <laughs> yep. is like is a useful deterrent. Yeah. Well, then let's talk about this week's challenge. Okay. Um, we uh, used uh, Max's rules for social media <laughs> etiquette. We abided by them, or we did, tried to abide did, by them. Did we use them? Did we? Well, we'll get into that. <laughs> and we, um, and then we set time limits on all of our apps, mm -hmm. or at least all the apps we use. I, I did it phone wide. I don't know what you did. I did it phone wide, and also specific to Twitter and Instagram. Mm. Um, As I, we all know, I don't have Twitter on my phone anymore. That's right. right? Yeah, 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 Twitterless, which has been great. Okay. Um, I found that I actually, I think we maybe should have done this one at the start of the challenge because at this point. I'm not using the apps anyway. Right. So I put these time limits on it and was never. Never hit. I was never it. close hit to him okay, either. Okay, great. But yeah. I, I, because 
Ma- Max did a little bragging yesterday <laughs> about one of his, a couple of his days and the time limit, which m- makes me think that I lost. But anyway, um, so I so thought <laughs> it's, it's important to break up with your phone for the purpose of shaming your colleagues. Yeah, right? I mean, look, that's what I was in it for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so favorite part of the challenge uh, mm-hmm. this week. I mean, I would say that the I guess the app limits, because the, first of all, they were easy, like we said, it's I true. think I could. Yeah. So I set them at an hour 30. Mm-hmm. For the, so hour thirty for the whole phone. I, I Keep in mind, for, I, used, I was when we started this thing. I was at like what four hours, hours a day, six no, hours you were a day, at six hours. Yeah, I was yeah. at six hours a day. So I didn't come close to one thirty. Mm-hmm. Um, if they were set at, I'm trying to think, if they were set in an hour, that would have been trickier. When you were actually like bumping up against it. Yeah, but yeah. I actually think that one thirty mm-hmm. could be sustainable for a, lo- a longer term. And that's what you want. Right? Maybe You're two, not, you're not <laughs> doing it to like torture yourself. Right. You're doing it to find that sustainable limit that you can live with. So I liked the I liked the app limits. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, what, what about you? What was your favorite part? Uh, well, so for the app limits, when I heard that you were setting it for an hour 30, I of course set mine to an hour and 29 minutes Asshole. because that's right. That's, that's the energy I'm trying to bring to this. Um, I liked the social media diet. I think I a little bit overcomplicated in giving us all of those rules. I should have just given us the Maggie Haberman rule, mm, which is... Which I would have also broken. <laughs> Why would you have? But I think the like the Maggie Haberman rule, which I love, which is but anytime you're going to post something on any social platform, ask yourself, is this essential to say? And is it essential that I am the one to say it? And mm. I actually think it's like a great rule that will 98% of the time lead you to not tweet something. Um, John, how do you think you did the Maggie <laughs> Haberman rule this so, week? Okay. All right. I just want to, I just want to lay out my case here. Um, so we did this, we set the last challenge Wednesday, mm-hmm. uh, last Wednesday, uh, in, there was an event happening on in the Wednesday, morning in your defense. Uh, yeah. And we knew, and I knew going into it that just hours after the challenge began, <laughs> Ron DeSantis was announcing his candidacy in on Twitter spaces with Elon <laughs> Musk, which is like it's the temptation. Of, it's like just it's it's, it's the, it's you the couldn't perfect have, storm. You couldn't of have designed discourse. a temptation yeah. greater for me. It's like and, the, it's like the end of Twister, the like category five storm of like online dunkability. And not only that, mm-hmm. it ended up, as everyone now knows, a c- complete disaster. Crying out for dunks. Complete disaster. <laughs> so even if it had been a, I might have. I might have been able to abide by the rules if it had been a just a normal announcement that mm-hmm. a lot of people were mm-hmm. mocking because the people would have mocked it no matter what. But the fact that it was a compl- the worst presidential announcement perhaps in history, <laughs> and I'm and me, I'm just gonna sit there and not tweet, and it's, it's a test. and it's taking place on Twitter. The universe provided the ultimate test. I just want to. Your... I just want. I just want to read two <laughs> two items from Max's social media code of conduct. Uh, just just two. No participating in the prevailing discourse of the moment unless it's a topic you're professionally required to speak on. I am professionally <laughs> required to speak on the prevailing discourse of the moment. That is my way. job. I'm Tra- like, I'm like, I'm like when Kendall tells his ex-wife, I am I'm the things I'm doing on six continents. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the kind of spirit that you want to bring to this, right? Is the like Kendall with his family, yeah, you with your it. smartphone. Yeah. And number seven, uh-huh. universal carve out exception for big breaking u- news. Universal <laughs> carve out exception. So in big the, breaking the news. The forty eight hours after we supposedly began adhering to the social media diet, which is supposed to limit and control your addiction to social media, mm-hmm. you tweeted. I counted. 45 times. Did I tweet 45 times? You tweeted For, uh, Were they original tweets times. or were they... No, this is not even counting retweets. Tweets and replies, 45. Oh, and replies. Now we're counting oh, kind of replies. <laughs> the replies now, will always get you. <laughs> I, I do hear you on the carve outs, but if you're tweeting 45 times in the 48 hours after instituting the social media diet, do you think maybe there's a little bit of a like letter verse spirit of the law <laughs> thing happening here? No, I do. I'm going to defend myself on this. <laughs> you think so? You think you did an amazing job? You knocked it out of the park. No, I think there was an unfortunate circumstance uh-huh. that was hard to see past. Would you like to know how many times I tweeted about the Ron DeSantis? Event? Uh, well, okay. What what did you do? Once? Zero. 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 And do you know what? Who noticed now, the difference? Who cared? Nobody. Because nobody cares. <laughs> Only thing that you're doing when you're tweeting about the thing everybody is tweeting about is participating in your own addiction. It was so fun. Your own. Okay, it is. It was a little. It bit was fun. a little fun. I, I will also, be honest, in my I defense, watching a little jealously. If you look at my tweets, mm-hmm. number of tweets in the week before Ron DeSantis, mm-hmm. 
And certainly in all the days after, because we were doing these rules, mm -hmm. you will see that. And I think the before is even more <laughs> instructive here. That before these rules were thrust upon me, I was not, I was following most of these rules anyway. Okay. Because okay. I've been, yeah. I've just, it was a, it was I mean, a unique circumstance. Do you feel like you're less addicted to Twitter though? Because oh yeah. Because you're not, and I'm, I'm, I'm sincerely, I'm not trying oh, to give yeah. you a hard time. You do seem like you're still on it a fair amount. Um, no, I feel like I am. I feel like I'm much less addicted so to what Twitter. Feels so th I think the addiction was severe. Okay. But sure. I don't tweet as much. Okay. Um, I use uh, lists now. Oh, nice. So that I'm not just scrolling. So you're not following everybody, but just curated. No, and differently, if, depending okay. on what's in the news. So I have like a, a oh, legal experts list when, right. you know, Trump crimes are in the news. I have a Hill reporters list for right. the debt ceiling. I have a just news list, which is literally hmm. people who are just reporting the news, no takes, just news, which I, that's what I use the most. That is really That has smart. been huge. It's also good because that cuts out the algorithm. Now the algorithm is not choosing what you see. Yes. You're choosing what you see. Taking it off my phone has been huge. Yeah. Um, And so when I wanted to know what's breaking in the news i'll just like go to the new york times or go to the washington post app on my phone and i'll just read that you know so i don't have to do twitter so i am and i don't get in twitter fights i mean i haven't yeah. gotten in twitter fights in a while yeah. um or at least i don't think but um <laughs> not and, with not with ron yeah and i don't do i don't count. do a lot of outrage i try to like i i to the extent that I'm making fun of Elon Musk or Ron DeSantis, yeah. it's like sarcastic. I'm trying to joke around. I'm like replying to friends on like some. A lot of those replies were right. to like you, Tommy, Dan. Yeah, you were tagging me in. I think yeah, almost I was, all of my tweeting this week was mm -hmm. replying to you tagging me in. Yeah, I was trying to, to tag you in. To I was explain to, that just trying to drag you in. <laughs> you did so, just like, dragging me into the muck. But it does go back to what I like about what I always liked about Twitter, which I feel like has mostly been lost. Mm -hmm. And I think is the best quality of Twitter, which yeah. is it's a place where you can go and joke about the news mm -hmm. with your friends, mm -hmm. you know, That's or, true. or people is, who are not are like, like in your life, like in person, but you've met on Twitter and they're still fun, you know, like right. that, that. I think it's a good use of Twitter. And it's mostly gone away because Elon has it's you a know, nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, degraded the platform. But I, I do miss that. So I and a bunch of journalists who were really struggling with our Twitter addiction and not just the time on the app, but feeling the compulsion to tweet, feeling the compulsion to participate and whatever is the like bullshit commentary discourse, main character nonsense of the day and getting dragged into the like Twitter view of any news stories, which is just like much more outrage prone, much more black and white, much more Manichaean than the like way that you would talk about it in any normal way. Mm. We all switched to a big like Slack that we just set up where there's like 30 or 40 of us. And any time, and I, I tried a little bit to write this into the rules, any time we want to tweet about something, we all just go talk about it in the Slack, which is great because then you're getting all of the upside, but you're not getting the algorithmic manipulation that comes with posting on Twitter. You're not getting the psychological distortion that comes from getting feedback from a thousand people, which our brains are not wired to handle. You're not getting that like feedback loop for outrage or for misinformation. And that took me a long, long time to adjust to. That's more than a like one week thing. It took yeah. me like a better part of a year, I would say. But I would encourage to the extent that you or people generally are looking to wean themselves off of not just spending time on the apps, but the like social media way of looking at the world, switching to the slower apps, I find really, really helpful. Yeah, I will say um, when I tweeted, is this whole announcement just going to be <laughs> Elon Musk and David Sachs? jerking themselves off <laughs> I was gonna, um i was i did i did that was you. that was originally a text <laughs> uh -huh. to tommy and dan and you were so and Rhodes happy and cody yeah. and uh yeah it was it was a text to them and i was i was like you know what the, the world needs the, to see it, it just can't stay on this text chain <laughs> this needs people need to hear this and they need to hear it from me i was they need to hear it from i me had two tweets of yours i was going to read off to you to ask like are we social media dieting that was one of them <laughs> are elon and david jerking themselves off and the other one was when you quote tweeted a Morning Joe screenshot of the audience numbers for Ron DeSantis versus like other audience numbers for other events and tweeted the phrase truly historic, <laughs> which is like a good dunk. But are we participating <laughs> perhaps in the social mediafication of our political discourse? I saw myself at that moment you in, were a, out, in a great battle against the forces <laughs> of David Sachs and Elon Musk trying to lie about how great the Twitter spaces thing went. And I was like, we need to bring some facts it's to this. So and you know what? A, some producer at Morning Joe, they brought the facts. 
<laughs> well, we can thank you for saving our democracy <laughs> via tweets. You may have sacrificed mm. your soul in the process. But you know what? But, uh, um, okay, so we also had some unplugged hobby time this week. Oh, yeah. What was your hobby? Um, so it's supposed to be an hour day, this right? This is another, it's yeah. just, un, you know, it's just um, tough circumstances for me for this week. <laughs> so uh, Thursday and Friday, Thursday and Friday morning, because mm-hmm. we did it started Wednesday, I did play piano. Wow. Um, I did play? do some writing. So I'm, I, 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 I can't, I think I mentioned this last week, but I am, I'm, I'm playing a song at uh, my best friend from childhood's wedding mm-hmm. uh, on Labor Day. I'm also speaking at the wedding. So I was like, whew, I got to start that stuff now. Yeah. Are you stressed about it? Um, I'm not stressed about it yet, but it's, okay. I'm a little more stressed about the speech. I, yeah. I like, he, he wants the, the song that he wants is um, a song I've played for years. What's just, the song? Uh, your song, Elton John's. Wow. Yeah. Nice. That. That's a great choice. It's a great choice. So, uh, so I practiced that. And I Are just, you going to dress up in a white suit with sequins and I am, giant sequins? I am. Okay, Big cool. Piano, yeah, you're yeah. actually, for people who are not watching YouTube, you're actually wearing your Elton John costume right now. <laughs> I, you look I got the glasses and the, yeah, yeah it's very cool. Um, and so <laughs> I did that. I started doing a like brain dump of things that I might want to put in the speech. Mm-hmm. So I did that writing. And then on Friday, we went to Santa Barbara. Okay. And uh, Emily and I went, we took Charlie. We went with uh, the Vitors. We went with our friends, the Duddas. They nice. have ki- they have two toddlers. Tommy and Hannah have a baby. So my hobby for those days <laughs> was chasing kids around. Was we all, sta- we all stayed children. in the same house. Yeah. Was yeah. just chasing <laughs> everyone around. It was extremely tiring. It sounds like and chaos. Let me tell you, when we finally got all the kids to nap or to sleep, all the parents were so tired that. Uh, people just sat on the couch and they were on their phones, except me, because I was part of this fucking challenge. So I was staring off into space. Did I want to go get my Kindle? Yes, I did. Was it uh-huh. in the bedroom? Because Char- Charlie was in our room in the oh, pack and play. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I couldn't get the Kindle either. Okay. So I was just sitting there, just staring into space, hoping one of my friends would talk to me. It's a shame there are no books or magazines out in the wider world that you could have. There probably your were hands a on. few magazines in that house. There's that usually, I could have especially a rental house, is usually an old magazine. There's usually an old like Vanity Fair or something. Emily did at one point. She was like, "You can leave while he's doing that. <laughs> you can like go. You can take my car into Santa Barbara and like go see the world." I was like, "By myself? It what is, is that going to be doing?" It's amazing to think that this is a problem we used to have routinely where you have like an hour and a half of downtime and no phone to like lose your soul to yeah it was that so that was that was tough i did i do i acknowledge that i have an easier version of this because i don't have kids so i'm at home and it's like what do i want to do with the next two hours literally anything that i want i actually the where it really (laughs) where i really noticed it is Mm -hmm. So we came home Monday, and I hadn't even thought about, like, oh, what are we going to do with Charlie Monday at home because it's a holiday. And (laughs) he takes a nap. He wakes up. Emily is taking a nap. I start playing with Charlie, and he wants to play with all the Play-Doh in our house on his playground, Mm -hmm. on the top of his playground, which is just this little spot where the before he goes down the slide. And so the two of us are up there playing with Play-Doh. I did not bring my phone. For two and a half hours after that weekend, <laughs> sitting there playing with Play Doh. And I was like, what is happening? How much time has gone by? Where am I? That sounds great. You yeah, were disconnected. It was, it, I was disconnected, What'd but you it, make? I was very tired. Oh, we just, I don't know. We just, we made uh, pretend cupcakes. We it made so fun. things for the truck. Then we brought all the trucks up. Uh-huh. The trucks were playing with the Play Doh. It was a lot. Did you play with Play Doh when you were a kid? Um, we yeah, but I didn't like a lot of, I didn't like a lot of messes. This oh, the, this that's is, this right. Is my yeah, yeah, OCD yeah. coming yeah. out. I was the same way. Stuff that would like leave a lot of like. Do you remember slime and GAC? Yeah, it yeah. Would yeah leave I do. a like weird residue on your hands. Yeah, I, I always didn't. had a tough time with that. Even, even after the play doh, I was like, he, Charlie went inside, and I was like picking the little <laughs> pieces of play doh off the playground outside. I had a. Uh, I think it was like in kindergarten. I remember even my own teachers like making fun of me because we would be playing in like the sand castles or whatever, and I'd go wash my hands like every twenty minutes to wash the sands off, and even my teachers were like. You can just leave the sand on your fingers. Oh, like, no, what yeah. Are you doing? See, I couldn't yeah. do that. I couldn't do that. Um, so tell me about your week. Hobbies? So it was pretty easy. I just went for uh, a hike every day for mm. about an hour, sometimes with friends. Sometimes I would just go on my own. If I went on my own, I tried to not bring headphones, don't listen to anything, just like be out on the trail, make an eye contact with people on the hiking trail, petting dogs, just wow. being a like enlightened monk out like walking the hills. Wasn't that nice? It was great. Yeah, okay. I loved it. Would you recommend these challenges to our listeners? I would recommend so many of these challenges to our listeners. Like I said, I think it is really essential to start with a hard break. Like just get the flip phone. 
Hmm. I know everybody's thinking like, oh, the flip phone was just like a gimmick for the podcast, but just like one week without your smartphone, just take out the SIM card, put it into a $60 flip phone. You can get it on Amazon. You can do it. I hear, I can hear all of the listeners being like, oh, it's so hard. I have to check my email. It's not practical. Like, come on. It's not that hard. You're not that important. I have so many friends who have like very busy jobs. They did it. They met at work. It's just a week. And it's great. It completely resets your relationship to your phone. And it sets you up, I think, to go into on week two or three, setting a few more challenges for yourself that are sustainable that you can manage longer term. Here's what I would recommend to people for... I would do the cold turkey for a couple of days because okay. I think that's that's okay. important. I think... I would I would think hard about which social media apps you need on your phone mm -hmm. and potentially take them off mm -hmm. or at least put pretty strict limits would on. Would you it. replace them with anything? Uh no, but, uh, so the only thing that I really missed mm -hmm. I missed uh like texting with friends. Yeah. And uh and and just messaging friends so like WhatsApp and and iMessage I missed using those and that's just because I like want the connection with people that I know. And then I noticed that because this was a three-day week, we left on Friday, to, like, because I wasn't using my phone, because I didn't have my laptop with me, this was the first time I had, ha I was part of this challenge with no laptop to go to, like, Tough. there was things, like, I wasn't checking email, mm -hmm. Austin was trying to get, put a title on la last week's episode, and <laughs> we I were had, title list, yeah, yeah we and just I had to look drift. at the Slack for days. But you know what? It all worked out. It, it did all Everything work out. That fine. is a good point. That is a good point. It always, you, I, and I experienced this so many times when we had the flip phone. There's so many times and you think being away from my email, being away from text message, whatever, for an hour, two hours, it's going to create these catastrophic problems. It's going to be such a big issue. And it never, ever, ever is. If it's an emergency, which it's never going to be, somebody will call you. But it's not going to be an emergency. Yeah. You don't need to be on your email. And I remember thinking, too, I was like, I don't even know what's in the debt ceiling deal. <laughs> and then I like got back to I got back home. And then on Monday night, I was like reading everything. I'm like, oh, OK, I figured yeah, it out now. Right. I didn't. Just, I, who cares that I didn't know? I have a great email newsletter product for you. <laughs> don't need to read any tweets. Just open up what a day. You're going to be completely informed, probably pretty outraged. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, social media. Uh, time limits mm -hmm. or, or either off the phone or strict time limits and then maybe an overall phone time limit mm -hmm. that can uh, incorporate your need to text, check email, whatever else, but like will keep you on, a, a, you know, on, a, on the straight and narrow. Can I give you my hot take on screen time limits, especially the built in screen time limits on your iPhone? Mm. I don't think it works. You think you I, just blow through them too easily? I think you blow through them too easily. I think especially the one that is built into your phone. I mean, that's like getting a nicotine patch from the Philip Morris company. Like, come on. You really think Apple wants you to break up with yeah, your phone? That's they true. Don't. I might have been. It, it, I think it was more the competition with you and the fact that right. there's this public accountability than the screen time apps. Because I had a screen time app on uh, Twitter for a long time before I took it off my phone and, and I blew through it all the through, time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that you need to find, or at least I needed to find, other ways to make the phone less appealing to physically distance myself from the phone especially i thought those tricks were enormously helpful yeah the and physical that, distance that is will very... naturally bring you to a lower number of time on the apps if it's just like you're staring at the app and you want to open it but a little pop-up is telling you not to like that doesn't i don't think that that does anything to f like break the actual addiction i think you're right i think you're right i guess when it, yeah time limits me like i think that the the lockbox or at least putting your phone away for an mm -hmm. hour or two every day yeah. is like a good practice the three or four that i would strongly strongly endorse i think the easiest one of the ones that i would encourage people to do is get the lockbox mm. Like, and it doesn't need to lock. Like, it can be a shoebox or, like, just a kitchen drawer. It's just someplace to put your phone when you get home. Put yep. your phone overnight. Totally. Do not have it in your bedroom next yeah. to your bedside table. Don't let it be the first thing that you reach for when you get up in the morning. It's pretty easy because once you don't have your phone with you at home, you actually don't want to look at it. There's mm. other stuff at home that's also fun to do that's nice that's, like, better for you than your phone and you'll enjoy more than your phone. So that will be really easy. The one sec app, I hate to do, like, a paid unpaid product endorsement, but I think it's really helpful mm. where what it does, you go to open an app that you want to use less of, and it just makes you look at this like five or six second little screen. I found that that's so often just making me think for a second, do I really want to open Twitter? Of course not. Of course I don't want to open Twitter. Right. And then I would close it and put my phone away. And I found that really helpful for dealing with the addiction. Um, and then a like post-it note over your notifications, this listener suggestion that we mm. got, amazing. 
life changing. Oh, I forgot to say this is one that I, I and and just getting rid of notifications or only making yeah, having smart. notifications be badges on right. on your apps and not pop ups on your screen. Right. That's been huge for me. Yeah, and I I'm think, gonna I'm gonna keep that. Okay, nice. That's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the last one, the hardest one, is grayscale. But don't do grayscale first. Leave it last. Mm. Could do it for a few weeks. It was hard. I this so I've kept grayscale on since we started it. Wow. And it, not me. Because it's Love amazing. My colors. It's so effective. It's really hard, but it's so effective. But going to Vegas day, this weekend. Can't wait to just like sit in front of some slot <laughs> machines and look at some colors. Just because it's almost as addictive right. as your phone. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I went to send someone a picture, and I had to turn on color to like make sure that I got everything like in the frame. And turning on color for just a second on my phone, it was like putting a car battery to my brain. <laughs> yeah, I, I like had to put the phone down because it really jolted me. I had that experience when we took Grayscale off at the end of last week. And I was mm-hmm. like, like the colors on the phone seemed brighter and even they more do. inviting. Yeah. <laughs> and they seem, it's like a little bit overwhelming. Like I was like, I'm getting like seasickness a little bit from yeah. looking at these colors. All right. Uh, when we come back, uh, Carolyn Dumphy is back. Oh boy. And she is going to close out the offline challenge. Offline is brought to you by Zbiotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol. Drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Can't say enough good things about this product. Yeah. Some things you can't specifically can't say, but I, I love Zbiotics and I will be using the hell out of it this weekend because I'm going to a wedding I was where just, I'm going to have a good time. I was just about to say on my to-do list, packing for this wedding, I have right here. Ooh. Bring Z Biotics. Gotta right bring it. Gotta on the list. Gotta bring it. Bring Z Biotics. Okay. Give Z Biotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash offline to get 15% off your first order. When you use offline at checkout, Z Biotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash offline and use the code offline at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Z Biotics, for sponsoring this episode. Offline is brought to you by Mosh. Whether at the gym, on the go, or between meals with the fam, Mosh Protein Bars are the smart snack to keep your brain and body fit, fueled, and feeling good. At 160 calories and only one gram of sugar, Mosh Protein Bars are the guilt-free snack your brain and body will crave. Your brain is your number one tool, which is why Mosh Protein Bars were mindfully formulated by some of the top neuroscientists and functional nutritionists. Founded by Patrick Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver, Mosh is a mission-driven brain health and wellness company that donates a portion of all proceeds to support women's brain research through the Women's Alzheimer Movement at Cleveland Clinic. Don't settle for a mediocre snack when you can nourish your body and mind with the fuel it needs to succeed. So whether you're at the gym, on the go, or just living your best life, Mosh Protein Bars will keep your brain and body fit, fueled, and feeling good. John, Mm -hmm. do we have any more of these at the office? Because I am hungry. Me too. And I couldn't find any in our office because I read that we were going to do this ad and suddenly I got really hungry for one Mm -hmm. and I looked and I couldn't find it. So that's a problem. Everybody's hook them. That's okay. We'll figure one out. more. I'll call uh, Patrick. Okay, great. I'll get, I'll, I'll get in touch with Maria. Great. Head to moshlife.com slash offline to save 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack, which includes all six mouthwatering flavors. M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash offline. Offline is brought to you by bookshop.org. Finally, an online retailer is here to help you merge your two favorite things, your love of reading with your passion for supporting independent bookstores. Bookshop.org is here to help you feel good about buying books online again because every purchase from Bookshop.org supports local independent bookstores. We love Bookshop.org. We love it because we love independent bookstores. You know, it's the best way to buy books. It's, it's the, the best way, way to, to buy books. books. You, you want to you want to support them. It's, you know, there's so, a really cool one in Ojai that's that's out of doors. That's right. It's that's very right. fun. There's okay. a great one right on Larchmont, right right by uh, right by my house. Nice. Um, you know. Bookshop.org is a benefit corporation, which means that they're doing business for the public good. It's super easy to order a book online and have the profit from that sale go to your local bookstore. Plus, book recommendations on Bookshop.org come from real people who love books, not algorithms. So they do all the work. 
You get your book in the mail, and then bookshop.org gives that local bookstore a healthy share of the profit. They've raised over $25 million for local bookstores, are unapologetically anti-Amazon, and believe local bookstores are essential community hubs that foster culture, curiosity, and a love of reading. Bookshop.org is committed to helping local stores survive and thrive and are a certified B Corp named Best for the World by B Labs as one of their top 5% of B Corps in the world for their overall mission, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Whether you're searching for a buzzy new memoir or a fantasy novel that sweeps you away, Bookshop.org has just the book you're looking for. When you purchase from Bookshop.org, you're supporting local independent bookstores, so they'll be around for all of us to enjoy in the future. Feel good about where you buy books. Visit Bookshop.org slash crooked and use code OFFLINE10 to get 10% off your next order. That's code OFFLINE10 at checkout for 10% off your next order. All right, we're back. And here with us to close out the offline challenge is Carolyn Dumphy. What a ride it's been. Greeting, gentlemen. Greetings, gentlemen. I mean, apprentices. Oh, <laughs> of course. On. For those of you listening at home, know that we are doing our final and lowest budget parody of a reality TV show. I knew you always reminded me of someone famous. I could never put my finger on it, and but it's now Donald I get it. Donald Trump, that's, baby. That's the one. Wow. Yeah. You know what's funny is I was wondering what you'd bring out for this. There's part of me that I was like, are they going to do like Succession? Since it was, but this is sort of in the in the neighborhood. You know, we had to we we went on Friends of the Pod. We went on Discord. Discord, we were like, which ones should oh, we smart. pick? Someone, mm-hmm. someone had pitched, is it cake? And I genuinely <laughs> thought, I'll buy a cake, I'll steal one of your iPhones and, and it put it in cake. there and be like, guys, is it cake? Like that that's so kind of funny. where we're at. Is, okay. is my sense of psychological well-being cake? Exactly. <laughs> it could be, who's to say? But we're doing The Apprentice. And as you may notice, I am not doing an impression of Donald Trump. Yes. Thank you. And that is because we have reached the limit of liberals trying to <laughs> master the cadence and <laughs> demeanor of a sociopath. You're welcome. You're it. welcome, audience. Exactly. You're welcome. No one's ever going to get it 100% right. And what's crazier is we don't need to. He is a walking, walking cartoon already. That's, it's not hard to hear him. But enough about my love life. <laughs> <laughs> You're back. I'm back, baby. Did you miss me? <laughs> we did. Did we you did miss, miss me? You. We did. Me. So we wanted to choose The Apprentice as the last the last show because we really think it will go out with a bang. Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to say is, John, you're fired. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry, John. Already. That was, just, that was fast. <laughs> just ripping that Band-Aid that off. Fast. Right? So to set the stage, we have Max Anista in the lead just by one. And at the end of this segment. Okay, he, just by one. But one out of Just by one like, round. Out of like three. Okay. Yeah. We don't, so, need, Max won we don't need to brag. I won, we don't need to I be a brag. One round. Sore winner. This is all I have. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do believe that to be true. <laughs> but enough about my. But enough about his love life. <laughs> so either you both will leave here as friends and equals, or you get bragging rights for the rest of your life because maybe you do need something to hold on that's, to. Yeah. That's yeah. I could use it. Yeah. I like this frame. Right. So. <laughs> Wow. Save the, we save the best for last. We save the best for last. I'm telling you. So why don't we go through, I feel like you hit the ground running. So what was the hardest part of this challenge, like week after week after week? Like, did you just kind of like mentally prepare yourself? Like, that's it. I'm locking in. This is what I'm doing. I'm hermit boy for the next five weeks. The hardest part, honestly, was I was really worried about John. Mm. I was kind of stressed for him. Mm -hmm. First day out of the gate, he's blowing through the social limits. We already knew that he was worried about losing. And uh, I just, I kind of want everybody to win. You know, I was always like, as a kid, when we play Monopoly, I was like, wanted everybody to come out as like a winner at the same time. We get really stressed if somebody was losing. Of course, that's you. (laughs) 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 Of course. I think... You had a r- rough go. Mm-hmm. You've had a rough go the past five weeks. It's been challenging to say. Um, but I have actually a question directed to your family. What was <laughs> Emily's favorite challenge for you? And what was Charlie's favorite challenge for you? Oh, Charlie's favorite challenge was definitely the clown case. He just he really <laughs> visually, visually, visually he enjoyed the clown case, which right, again right. Very is much. concerning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I haven't asked. Emily yet 
Was there a one that like she saw that like it really tormented you, and there was probably a little bit of, of her being like, I "This mean, is funny." The, the, <laughs> the, yeah, I was gonna say the clown case, but she was troubled by the clown, clown case. case. She was troubled, um, but I think that just having this wasn't one of the specific challenges, but me not having Twitter on my phone, I think she enjoyed right. that. I right. Think she enjoyed that. So she noticed. Do you think she noticed like the difference? And, yeah, I yeah. think so. I think I don't want to speak for her, but uh, if you Great. asked her, I, I think she would say that. Great. I, I think hope. That, I think people. We, like could, know we could do the newlywed. Uh, game. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I would episode. actually love. She our a, surprise guest. Have her come into the office. I would love to do a digital original of like what your side of the story was and what her side of the story was would, with whiteboards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what question answers? You know. And now, as chancellor of the offline challenge. We have to start the victor, I mean, firing ceremony. John, it is now time for you to report your screen time. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Wrote them all down. Wednesday, 1 hour 19. Thursday, 49. Ooh. Whoa. Friday, 37. He's getting wow. better, people. He came here to win. <laughs> Saturday, 52. Oh, okay. Went back up. It's still pretty good. Under an hour? Sunday, hour one. Uh, Monday, 55. And then yesterday, because I'm a, I'm a procrastinator who likes to cram, 35. Whoa! Wow. You might have been. So what's the average? I don't know. Okay. We're going to have to. Well, and we'll Austin? figure that out in post. <laughs> it's going to go to the judges. <laughs> but that's amazing. You were, at, you were at six hours a day. I know. For like years. Yeah. But this one, this one almost killed me. Okay. This, <laughs> it did cost you everything, but you did get so much back. For the for the people at home, uh, watch the YouTube because you should see the amount of pain in John's face being like, this one really killed me, guys. This one really killed me. But you got to spend more time with your, you know, loved ones. That's yeah, that's nice. true. Yeah. That's true. You're like, uh, yeah, I guess that's a problem. <laughs> uh, so and I had... Uh, Maxinista. Uh, thank you. 77 minutes, 50 minutes, 51, 78. 19. Oh, that it was 19's great. Gonna it was an amazing him. weekend. 19 minutes, 29 minutes, 34 minutes for an average of 48 minutes, which is down exactly four hours from my average before we started the challenge. It's four hours a day of my life back. I really wow. feel it too. I feel like I have four more hours. You look lighter. 48 and minutes. Yeah, like I'm not going to be You might jump into the pool. Four, yeah, I'm <laughs> not going to be there. Let's not get carried I'm away. Not, I'm not fixing my personality. <laughs> Hey, John, yeah. I lost by four minutes again. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, oh, oh. Fuck. Not good enough, Favreau. But I am the <laughs> eldest boy. I am the eldest. I am the eldest boy. You're not. You're not even. Tommy is the eldest boy. You're not even the eldest boy. But hey, it wouldn't be a reality TV show. Six to five on the board. Incredible. Dun dun. Without a twist. <laughs> Mm-mm. I want each of you to make a case for the other of why they get fired off the offline challenge. <laughs> Wait, wouldn't it be nice if we made the case for why the other shouldn't lose? No, in the <laughs> in the show The Apprentice, which I watched one episode of in order to it. get the yeah. format, you have to like tell the other person like this person needs to be fired and this is why I need to be saved. So, but that's let's do nice Apprentice. I think John, I think you should win because you are most improved. Because you were starting, I was going to make that case for myself at too. like six hours, fifteen <laughs> minutes, something like that. So if we're off by four, if we're both, and actually, I think it's pretty striking that we are hitting about the same number. Yeah. Like maybe like last right. week was like an hour and fifteen. This week is like fifteen minutes. Maybe that's the amount of time you should spend on a phone. I was going to say, I think general. we're like cutting it pretty close to the bone with where we are now in our averages. And I, think I think that's, that's what the four right. minutes tells you. I think you. we're landing at like the natural place where one should land after a number of weeks. So my case, we're both winners. Oh, uh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, everyone, though? Mr. Everyone wins Monopoly. <laughs> You know what? Max stuck to the letter of the law on these challenges, and uh, it's particularly my 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 Ron DeSantis, Elon Musk faux pas on Wednesday. Sure. I, I don't, I don't, I think that disqualifies me from uh, from being a victor. You did, you did tweet about Elon Musk jerking off, which is which a lot. Is, I think that's great. Was really sort of <laughs> like it's good for it's good for my that. department. If we're still like in the addiction frame too, that was just like uh, yeah, I'm, I'm you're like just, I have no choice. <laughs> yeah, I, like Jesus took just the wheel. So, I don't even remember it. Just so hard off the wagon that it was it was just a spectacular. Just, just, that's just when like, it's. Tim Robinson, to... who said that? <laughs> so it's time to call your sponsor. You're tweeting about billionaires jerking themselves off. Exactly. 
And so now I have to, with much dismay, dismay, John, you're fired. Maxinista, welcome to eternal glory. Wow. Now both of you go to champion. therapy. <laughs> What? Because my therapist has heard way too much about the offline challenge. But I bet. So... I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I need to go to therapy? We're doing more podcasts. This is you a recurring right, series. Yeah. 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 You're right. We're going to be right. back here next week. All these guys <laughs> conflating therapy with podcasts. Here we go. <laughs> and you, here's the thing, is that you were on his case about participating in social media, like the chaos of that and being on Twitter. It's like, you're also part of the problem, too. <laughs> conflating therapy with podcasting. <laughs> but that's, it's at least better than social media it's like half a step so now we're arguing about semantics (laughs) (laughs) could never think that would ever happen from a new york times reporter (laughs) we gotta hear both sides truth is always somewhere in the middle that's That's what i like oh boy (laughs) that's number seven in the social media (laughs) don't don't find find the truth somewhere yeah Yeah. exactly both sides as chancellor i can only do so much to keep you on track so now it's time to bring in the big dogs After the break, you'll be joined by Catherine Price, author of How to Break Up With Your Phone. Catherine is an expert, having taught thousands how to regain control over their phones. She's here to truly teach you how to break your addiction with your iPhone, not just for six weeks, but for the rest of your life. Wow. I can't wait. I'm excited. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, thank you you for being the the best chancellor that offline has ever had. And (laughs) the only chancellor offline will ever have. And the only chancellor that Crooked Media will ever have. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you. Offline is brought to you by Sundays. Sundays is air-dried dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. Sundays was co-founded by Dr. Tori, a practicing veterinarian. It contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Besides USDA beef and all-natural chicken, you'll find digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger plus disease-fighting antioxidants. Dog parents report noticeable health improvements in their pups, including softer fur, fresher breath, better poops, and more energy. Sundays, yeah, it's for dogs in many ways. Luca and I love to curl up and watch the New England Patriots or whatever Mm. Uh, football game is on. We eat some Sundays. And, for dogs. And you both have better poops? You both t- it tastes tastes great. great. Fantastic poops. It's really Fantastic. good food. A lot of energy. No, we we love, uh, you know, I've been giving it to Leo. Leo likes it a lot. It has zero prep, zero mess, zero stress. It's uh, shelf stable. It's known as shelf stable, which makes it easy to feed your pup top quality food. Doesn't break the shelf. Doesn't break the shelf. Yeah, that's what it means. Every order ships right to your door, so you'll never have to worry about running out of dog food again. That's nice. You don't want to be running to the store suddenly when you're out of dog food. Uh, And Sundays cost 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all-natural ingredients for your pup. So we worked out a special deal for our dog-loving listeners. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. That's S-U-N-D-A-Y-S-F-O-R-D-O-G-S dot com forward slash offline. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. Offline is brought to you by Manukura. The best tasting honey on the planet comes from New Zealand. It's called Manuka Honey and it's made by a company called Manukura. It's called a super honey because of a unique combination of antioxidants and prebiotics, including a natural antibacterial compound called MGO, or as I like to call it, MGO, that only comes from the nectar of the manuka tree. This is some good honey, guys. It's delicious. Very tasty. Yeah, you think that all honey is the same? No, you haven't tried Manakura honey. Definitely not. Uh, It contains nutrients that support optimal immune and digestive health. Every batch is 100% traceable with a unique QR code on every jar. You can verify potency, purity, and even learn about the specific beekeeper that harvested your honey. Adopt your own beekeeper. The creamy caramel texture melts in your mouth and is unlike anything you've ever tried. Manukura's honey is available in a range of easy-to-use formats, including squeeze bottles and compostable honey sticks, so you can eat it straight or add to your favorite foods and drinks. If you head to manukura.com slash offline or use code offline, you'll automatically get a free pack of honey sticks with your order, a $15 value. That's M-A-N-U-K. O-R-A dot com slash offline or use code offline to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. You haven't tasted or seen honey like this before, so indulge and try some honey with superpowers from Manicora. Offline is brought to you by Choice Words from Lemonada Media. 
It's no secret that comedian Sam B is pro-choice. Yes, that choice, but also not just that choice. Sam is pro-choices, those crazy life-altering decisions that shift our life path and bring us to where we are today. Her next choice, starting a new podcast with Lemonada Media called Choice Words, where she interviews celebrities, politicians, and people she admires about the biggest decisions they made in their lives. She'll get into the gratitude or regret that accompanies each of their decisions and look at how that one moment impacted their life today. Choice Words is out now wherever you get your podcasts. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. We wanted to bring you on because uh, Max and I, in an attempt to um, alleviate some of our screen addiction, uh, have been engaged in what we're calling the offline challenge over the last couple of weeks. And you mm-hmm. have literally written the book on the topic <laughs> called How to Break Up with Your Phone. <laughs> so we wanted to have you on to help us close out the challenges and also help us create a, a more sustainable path uh, forward that doesn't involve... Uh, our producers abusing us <laughs> and uh, having fun at our expense, which I think is what they've been doing the last couple of weeks with clown cases and the like. Um, but before we get to all that, I'm really curious about your relationship with your phone, both before and after you wrote the book. Yeah, my relationship with my phone when I thought about writing the book. So I started thinking about this in about 2015, 2016 was not that different, I think, for most people's, except that instead of social media, I was scrolling through eBay looking at antique doorknobs. So maybe that's not at all like normal people. But because <laughs> we were renovating got their our thing. You know, it's a classic you know, story. I guess it's <laughs> really, yeah, exactly. Like it's almost cliche. Um, but uh, but I had these moments. We had, were renovating our kitchen, so I did have a reason to do that. But at some point, I realized I was scrolling through eBay in the same manner that people scroll through social media. When we were done with the renovation, I was just looking at doorknobs. And I had recently had a baby. My daughter was born in 2015. And I just remember having these moments up in the middle of the night with her where I was feeding her. And I I just started having these kind of out-of-body experiences, probably from fatigue, where I could see what the scene looked like from the outside. And she was looking up at me, and I was looking down at my phone. And yes. it just devastated me. And I have a background in in mindfulness. I like to think of a self-aware person. And I just realized that that is not the way I want her to interpret a human relationship. And it's definitely not how I want to be experiencing parenthood or my own life just in general. So that's what inspired me to write the book. And also, I have a background as a science journalist. So there were some actual scientific reasons I thought that might actually be detrimental and destructive to her, which I can go into if you want. But so I wrote How to Break Up With Your Phone. I, I basically, at that point, I know... I noticed there were a lot of books that kind of touched on this as an issue, but not ones that solved the problem. And I really wanted to try to solve the problem. And then I figured, you know, I'm not the only person struggling with this. It's just that not many people are talking about it yet. So that's why I ended up writing the book, which combines, as you guys know, a look at the reasons screens are so compelling, what that's actually doing to us. And then it also combines that with a 30-day plan to take back control. So that was, yeah, in 2015. Teen. It came out 2018. And I'm happy to say that I do feel that I have a much healthier relationship with my phone now. I think that it's important to recognize it'll never be perfect, but I feel a lot better than I did then. And I do not look at doorknobs anymore. <laughs> well, that's a win. I mean, you I know, know that um, I know that screen time is sort of an imperfect metric uh, by which to judge this. But how would you say your relationship with your phone is now? Like, are you spending... I'm, I'm I'm guessing you spend overall less time. Like, what is what does it look like now? How much do you need your phone? Well, I don't focus too much on the time itself. I focus more on how it makes me feel, what it's replacing. So, in other words, like, is my screen time getting in the way of something else that would be a better use of my time? And then, most importantly, what I'm doing with it. So. The main things that I use my phone for are communicating with friends, whether it's texting or phone calls. Honestly, I'd like to cut back on the texting because I don't think it's satisfying. And then another big use I have is that I use the Voice Memos app and Dropbox a bunch because I play, actually, as a result of writing this book, I ended up with more free time and I ended up starting to take guitar classes. And now I have an entire oh. community of music wow. friends. So we use Dropbox to share our recordings and Voice Memos to record ourselves and guitar tabs to uh, see charts when we want to play songs so if you looked at the objective screen time it might might seem high but to me using guitar tabs and voice memo is actually a great use of my phone yeah that's healthy yeah we all have excuses Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is it was it's so it really resonated with me to hear you talking about this story of being with your newborn and starting to realize not just the amount of time that you're spending on your phone, but how it is affecting you and affecting your life away from your phone. I had kind of a similar moment. I started writing about social media 
later than you, like 2017, but its effects on other people writing about like its effects in the Trump phenomenon or its role Mm -hmm. in like the Myanmar genocide was how I first came to it. But it took me like another solid year, even though I was writing and thinking about social media and smartphones all the time to realize that it was affecting me too. And I started reading these studies about how being on Twitter and Facebook changes your like emotional valence, not just when you're online, but in your offline life. And it makes me wonder because I know that you work a lot with other people in helping them to tackle their own smartphone addictions. What kind of stories you hear from people or moments of realization that they have about what it's taking away from them in their life away from their smartphone? Because I feel like that's such an important moment for all of us in kind of confronting this. Well, I think that is one of the most important points is the opportunity cost and then what our interactions with our phones are doing to us as people. You know, how are we experiencing our own lives? How are we treating other people? What is it taking away from us in terms of relationships? I hear all the time from people who feel that their spouse or partner or some loved one is, in their words, addicted to their phone and Mm -hmm. doesn't want to listen to them about it. And they feel completely powerless about what to do because I think we're finally now coming to a point where we're recognizing this really is an issue. But for a long time, it's been really easy to write it off as like everyone's on their phone or I'm just checking Twitter. Like, what's the big deal? You're overreacting. So a lot of what I do when I have interactions with people is to really empathize and validate them on the fact that this is a really big deal. For me, I think that one of the most powerful takeaways for myself that really, I don't know, solidified this is the observation that ultimately our lives are what we pay attention to. And Mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, whatever you're paying attention to, that's what you're actually going to experience in the moment. And that's what you're going to remember. And that means anytime we're making a moment to moment decision about where to direct our attention, we're actually making this broader decision of how to live our lives. And I think that's something that you both have been touching on in your conversations over the past month about this in different ways. But to me, that's been so powerful. I actually had a bracelet made for myself that says pay attention. And it's Mm. that's like my version of a tattoo. Like I don't want to commit to a tattoo, but I'll wear a bracelet. (laughs) Um, But it's a reminder that like that's what's at stake. You know, we're going to die and (laughs) we have the chance right now to live. So what do you want to do with it? There you go. That's my morbid uh, takeaway for you. <laughs> I'm glad you went there because that's that's too. that's what I've been thinking for the last couple of years yeah. about around this. I mean, and, and it's interesting your the story about um, when your child was born because I, I really started thinking about this when my child was born, which was you know July of 2020. So we were already oh. it was in the middle of the pandemic. We were all on our phones too much, on our screens too much, and I think my anxiety over being a new parent uh, partly manifested itself in me just staring at my phone even more and using the Mm. excuse of, well, it's 2020. I I didn't know we were going to have a kid or there's going to be a pandemic. So I thought I was going to be paying close attention to this election every single day and I need to do it for my job. So I'm going to be on the phone on Twitter all the time. And I sort of missed the first couple of months. Every time I was like worried about something with parenting, I would just like be on my phone. And now I, you know, part of this offline challenge, I like when I come home now, at like, you know, five thirty, six o'clock, I put my phone down in my office and then um, I hang out with my son, Charlie, my wife, Emily, for a couple hours until he goes to bed. And it's really it's nice, you know, because it's <laughs> like that's to your point about what you pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Suddenly it just it finally takes your mind out of whatever work thing, news thing you were t- thinking about. And now it's just like here I am with these two people who are most important people in my life. And now I get to actually talk to them and spend time with them. Yeah, I mean, that's really important. I actually really like that you're emphasizing the importance of the ritual of it, too, that you're now making a point to put your phone away when you come in. Because I think part of the issue is that there's no boundaries. I mean, especially during the peak pandemic times, there certainly were no boundaries, but it's still just so hard when you have work encroaching on home life and your work email is on your phone, but that also has your personal texts and like your podcast, everything. Everything is all combined together. So it's so important to create these separations. What what are your thoughts on um, the effect of all these screens and all this screen time on kids? And how are how are you dealing with it with your own children? Oh my god! I mean, that's a separate. <laughs> <laughs> how much time do you guys have? I don't think it's good. <laughs> I think it's extremely, extremely, extremely yeah. bad on so many levels. I I've heard you guys comment on, and I think uh, maybe one of your other guests was talking about, you know, when you hand it, watching a kid get a phone and then seeing what happens to their face and how quickly they become mesmerized and you see this blue light on the child's face. I mean, you can get a kid to shut up for hours if you're annoyed with your child just yeah. by handing them a phone. Um, 
I think it's having a lot of different effects. I think one of the primary things is the distraction of just training our brains to be constantly distractible. You know, it takes a lot of effort to actually learn how to do things like concentrate. I know you both have been talking about your frustrations with not being able to sit and read books anymore, right? That's in part because our brains naturally want to be distractible because if you're going to be scanning the horizon for threats, it's good to be distractible. You don't want to be lost in a book if there's something that's trying to attack you. So our brains naturally are going to want to be distractible. And it's taken a lot of work for us to learn how to read a book. So imagine that you're a child who's never learned how to really cultivate that sustained attention. And mm. you're giving them a, you know, a device that essentially fragments their attention from a very early age. Then there's all sorts of issues with social media and the impact on mental health. That's becoming obviously a much bigger issue. I know that you had the Surgeon General on recently talk about that. Um, I'm somewhat hopeful in that I think that the tide is beginning to turn where, again, this is being taken much more seriously. There's been health advisories from both the Surgeon General and the American Psychological Association just within the past couple of weeks about social media and teenagers in particular. But for my daughter, I have one kid. What we do is we try to be very intentional about screen usage. She does not have her own devices. And <laughs> probably the funniest thing that she does is that they, have, they do have iPads in her school and she's taken to making pretend phones out of cardboard. Um, nice. Yes, I'm the author of How to Break With Your Phone. So she went ahead and she told the pediatrician oh this. She's like, the pediatrician's like, what do you like to do for fun? She goes, I make cardboard phones. The pediatrician goes, well, that's deliciously ironic. Wow. But I will say I was so, I was like, oh my God. But then I looked at what she was doing with her phones and iPad. I'm like, what is on, what, what are her apps on this piece of cardboard? And it was like, yeah, what was she doing with them? Great question. She was calling our dog. So like legit phone calls. <laughs> she brought one of these to dinner and she was, she had this entire teenage kind of like, oh my God, like kind of thing of like, you wouldn't believe what Tasha's saying. I'm like, what is Tasha saying in your imagined conversation with the dog? Apparently she was singing a song, but she has that. She has like, I, in her words, and I quote, easy math was the name of the app. Um, <laughs> and then I think she had drawings. So I was like, okay, like that's okay with me. She's thinking about phones as a tool. And that's something I wanted to convey in general is like the phone's an amazing tool, right? It's when it becomes mm. a temptation, essentially, that's like sucking your life away. That's the problem. But I do laugh every time I'm like, oh my God, seriously, like another cardboard phone or an or a laptop. She made a laptop. Oh, well. I feel like something that I have noticed, and I'm curious if you found the same thing in working with people on their smartphones, is how many people our age, because I think we're all about the same age, started to think about their own relationship with their smartphone the first time they had that experience you're describing of seeing their infant or their kid glued to a phone and realizing, first of all, I have this thing around me way too much. And second of all, if it's doing this to my kid, what is it doing to me? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, I hope, <laughs> I hope that that's a wake up <laughs> moment for people. You know, you have that and you also have people walking down the street with strollers that actually have a built in phone holder so the kid can oh, watch no. the phone. Yeah, that makes my heart sink. <laughs> that's tough. Um, yeah. All right. So, so I know our producers um, walked you through uh, the offline challenge just for folks at home who might not uh, remember. We did uh, flip phones week one. That was cold turkey. Week two was mindfulness. We did meditation. The one sec app, new wallpapers. Week three was physical restrictions, lockbox, uh, new phone cases. Uh, we did grayscale too. Uh, week four was willpower. We, we did uh, Max's social media code of conduct. Well, we tried. One, one of us Some did. of us tried, yeah. yeah. Um, there was some unplugged. <laughs> Unplugged hobby time, <laughs> um, to your point about uh, guitar. We tried to ha get hobbies. Uh, and then we set app limits. What are your thoughts on our approach? Um, and w what would you say are sort of the strengths and weaknesses of how we went about this? That's a much gentler way than what your producers told me. Austin's like, throw us under the bus. Tell us what we did wrong. And I was like, okay. I mean, that's, that's fine, too. That's, that's yeah, fine, too. We can a little take it. harsh. We can take it. <laughs> well, I actually didn't. I didn't hear the. I listened to all the ones that were available, but I didn't hear how your hobbies and stuff went. So I, I'm curious about that. Um, mm -hmm. But my take is that one of the things I like the most about the approach that you guys took is the playfulness. And that you actually made it into mm. almost a game between you. Because mm. one of the most common mistakes I see people make when they try to change their relationship with their phone is to come at it from this kind of punitive place of like beating themselves up. Maybe you beat yourselves up as well. You may well have. Um, in no fact, more, I feel have. like I've gotten yeah. to no know you guys a bit. No more than we do in our normal day-to-day -day lives. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't know, but we've spent a lot of time together in the past day because I've been listening to all the back episodes of this. So I guess I do know that you have somewhat of a tendency <laughs> self-criticism but you're also having fun with it so i would say that we're, that's we're very important people. 
Yeah. <laughs> Is that like another offshoot podcast? Just broken people? <laughs> broken people. That, yeah, it's a good that's, idea. That's actually a good one. Um, so I would say that that's really important. Like a lot of times when people ask me, well, how can I deal with my family and phones or my partner or whatever? I'm like, try to make a game out of it because you don't want to be coming at it with this finger wagging kind of thing. Mm. But to other people or to yourself, because you're not who wants to stick with that? That's not any fun. Um I should say also my follow-up book to How to Break With Your Phone was about fun. So I think about fun a lot. So I think that that was a really good part of it. I think that there were elements in what you guys did that were very useful as kind of thought prompts. Like I thought it was very interesting to listen to you guys talk about what you'd done. And to me, the most valuable part of it was not necessarily the exercises you tried, but it was more the insights that you came up with as a result of those exercises. So for example, Mm -hmm. Max, I know you were talking about (laughs) We use our phones as avoidance strategies to avoid feeling bad about the, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, void within ourselves and our existential <laughs> despair. Um, oh, you got that it. sounds exactly like Max. Yeah, that's right. right. Okay. Yeah. I was like, big, I'm not sure if I'm paraphrasing guy. you or just talking about myself. But um, anyway, so, you know, I think that's a very important insight or your point that addiction is a symptom and not necessarily the problem itself. Like those are deep thoughts, like all caps, right? And I think it's very interesting than just making some simple changes to how you interact with your phone can lead you to have these deeper realizations about how we're coping with life and reevaluate if whether if that's actually how you want to be approaching life. Um, with that said, I think that the thing that I would recommend changing about your approach is that some of the stuff definitely felt very gimmicky. I mean, I think you, that was part of the point. Like, although I really want to see the clown case, fascinated by that. Um, oh God, I never want to see the clown case again. I, the clown case <laughs> like, was is it great. Have a Everybody clown should get on a clown it? case. It, yeah, it have, like, it there's a clown, clown on the back. Yeah. There's a clown on the back. So, like a creepy clown, um, like a bozo clown. Yeah. Oh, I mean, my my <laughs> wife did tell me that I, I looked like a pedophile. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, you know, there's some some value in that. Maybe I'm not sure. But I think that if I were to, and I'd love to do this with you guys to come up with a more systematic approach, I think that there's a. it's important to have an actual goal established at the beginning. So in other words, what does success look like and why are you doing this? And I know you guys talked a bit about this in the sense of feeling like you were wasting your lives on your phones, right? Fair enough. <laughs> or looking at the objective numbers on the phone. But I think that there's it's worth having a bit deeper of a conversation about, okay, well, you will be interacting with your phones. You know, as you both said, like the flip phone was a useful experiment, but you're not going to stick with the flip phone permanently. So how are you going to create a sustainable relationship with this device that is simultaneously incredibly useful in modern life? Some might say essential, but also, as you pointed out, designed to be a slot machine. How do you create that sustainable relationship? So I think the important big picture thing is there needs to be an overarching plan and goal established so that you can then take steps that all line up with that umbrella goal, if that makes sense. Could you talk about um, suggestions or ideas that you have or that you've shared with people on how to make it fun? Because I really agree that that was not something I thought about as an important part of this going into it. It was something that we kind of I think discovered along the way, but felt so essential. I know for me in sticking with it and making it feel like it was not this drudgery I was putting myself through, but something that was really worthwhile and in creating like a sense of accountability. But of course, part of how we were able to do that is we have, you know, a podcast and they're like support team that comes with that. And, um, Fortunately, not everybody in America yet has a podcast, although it, it does feel like <laughs> we're headed in that we're direction. Yeah. yeah, we are getting right. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the curve is, is reaching uh, one for one. But until we get to that point, what are things that people can do to make breaking up with their phone feel fun and social the way it has for us? Well, I think the first step is to make the shift between just the general goal, which is not to spend less time on your phone. Because like, why? Like, that's a dumb goal. <laughs> it's like, right. why? Why? Yeah, that's a good point. What's the pr- yeah. Right? It's like, again, the symptom versus the problem thing. Like, what I think of it as is that you're trying to feel more alive. You're trying to get back in touch with what brings you joy. You're trying to enjoy your brief moment on this planet. That's the goal, at least to mm-hmm. me, if I were to say, like, what's the main goal here? And that simple shift from this attitude of restriction to one of kind of expansion and joy like that to me is the first step in turning this into something that goes from being you know a restrictive diet to actually learning to find the foods you love that make you feel healthy and good like that kind of shift so I think that's the first step I would take and then once you have that you start to actually 
make these changes not out of a sense of obligation, but more out of a sense of curiosity and playfulness. Mm -hmm. Like, well, let's see. Because one of the problems now is that we have gotten so used to allowing our time to be filled by whatever is on our phones that we have lost sight of how we want to fill our own time. And that can actually be very scary. Like that truly, I mean, joking aside, can be an existential moment where you're like, oh my God, I actually don't know anymore what brings me joy. I don't know. And if I do know, I don't know how to make it happen anymore. That's really scary. So I think it's very important to accept that scariness and say, that's all right. Like I'm giving myself the opportunity to play around with what might, me, what might make me feel better. And that playfulness is actually very essential to the fun aspect. On that same note, I also think that getting other people to do it with you inherently will make it more fun because yeah. then you have a sense of connection. Because honestly, one of the reasons we're reaching for our phone so much is that we're lonely. And so you can actually, in a meta mm. sense, use the challenge of trying to break up with your phone and create a better relationship as a way to connect more with people you care about. And I heard you guys talk about that multiple times in terms of conversations you had. Um, and then you can just like gamify it in your own way. You know, if you're in a family and you're like, okay, right, we got a contest here. We have a basket by the door. Everybody puts their phone in the basket or in the closet or whatever at night. And if mm. the kids, if anyone's found cheating, then that's a point for the person who caught them cheating. And at the end of the week, whoever has the most points gets to choose an activity for the family to do together um, that they think would be fun. Like there's ways to make it into kind of like a fun, playful yeah. competition, but with this very serious goal, which is to reorient ourselves towards what actually matters to us in life. We both had a, a break between our last challenge ending and, and today. So at where we were just sort of on our own. Mm -hmm. And I had the, this interesting experience where like towards the end of the challenges, I did feel like it was all getting too restrictive. And my phone checking behavior was transferring to my um, checking my screen time behavior and like must <laughs> yes. beat max behavior, you know, which is just like I, I picked another, up on that. another part of the OCD spectrum, you and, know. Which, and yet for all of that obsessive trying to win. I still lost. Yeah. 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 So then, so I sort of like, all right, now I got a break. Let's see what happens. And I was like, so I went to Vegas over the weekend with some friends. Wow. It was a bachelor party. I know. So you and, went to the giant smartphone I went to in the Nevada. Giant, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and the way there and when I first saw my friends, I was like, the phone was somewhere else. I was happy. I don't care. I don't need the phone. It's great. And then by the time I came home, when I was like a little hungover and tired, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. it was like, that was the biggest relapse, just checking Twitter. And yeah. But at least I like clocked it then. And I was like, what am I yeah. doing? Like put this thing I, down. But it is, it's that exact feeling that you were just describing, Catherine, which is like, and this is what made me want to look for more sort of sustainable strategies here because I was like, okay, uh, I know that the the stuff we did was too restrictive, but I but the relapse is too easy. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you sort of, uh, how, you know, what's the strategy to make it a little bit more sustainable once you've gone through the, the cold turkey phase? <laughs> well, first of all, <laughs> I'm picking up on a theme here because the one of the last episodes I listened to is when you went to a wedding and mm. you had your phone in your pocket and you were like, I was so good yeah, during John the wedding. Yeah, living like, it up. Right. He's like, he's really, you really are like, I just mostly <laughs> in this living room, but um, two years of being home. <laughs> yeah. <okay>. yeah <laughs> but you were, but I, you ex explicitly that you're like, yeah. And then the next day I was a little hungover and I was tired and then I relapsed. So <laughs> it is it, pointing that well, out. It's like eating junk. It's like eating junk food when it you're is, tired. Right. Yes. It's yes. the same kind of, I think you wrote, you wrote about this, that it is, it's, yeah. there's a lot of similarities to food there and mm -hmm. when food yeah. becomes comfort food and it's self soothing. Right? right. And all that. Very self soothing. Well, two thoughts on that. One is that, I did notice when I first heard you tell that anecdote, I was like, oh, I don't know if they've actually gotten into the uh, subject of what are your alternatives, right? Because like you can't mm. break a habit, if I may paraphrase Charles Duhigg here in The Power of Habit, like you can't break a habit, but you can change a habit. And the best way mm. to change a habit is to figure out what your brain is after and then to give it an alternative. So I think it's very important to try to figure out alternatives and then make them as easy as possible. Because as you've also pointed out, one of the main problems with our phones is the lack of friction. It's so easy to get to the junk mm -hmm. food. So you want to simultaneously make it harder to get to the junk food, but you also want to give yourself some alternatives that are very easy. So I would recommend putting some thought into like, well, what do you actually want to do? What, what makes you feel kind of self-soothed that isn't just scrolling through your phone. I actually came up with an exercise that people have found useful called what for, why now, and what else, mm. WWW for short, that you could play around with. And basically what I normally recommend people do is that you put some kind of like rubber band or something around your phone uh, for a couple of days 
so that when you pick up your phone on autopilot, you notice that you've done so um, because a lot of it is on autopilot. And when you notice you've, because you'll be like, why the heck is there a rubber band around the phone? And you'll be like, oh, right, because I'm supposed to just ask myself these questions. And you basically ask yourself, yeah, what for? What was the purpose? Like, did I actually have an email I needed to send? Was I checking for a particular, I don't know, news story, whatever? Did I even have a purpose? And then you ask yourself, well, why now? Why am I doing it right now? Is it because there's actually a time sensitive reason for this? Or is it, for example, that I'm kind of hungover and tired? Often the why now answer is going to be emotional which is very important. And I think you both have started to pick up on this is that a lot of times you'll, your mind will come up with an excuse like, Oh, I was doing it cause I needed to do blah. But in reality it's that you wanted to self soothe or it's that you felt a little lonely and you wanted to feel a connection. So you like go on a dating app or social media or it's, you feel anxious or it's, you know, you need a distraction cause you're tired of what you're doing at work. And then you ask yourself the final question, which is what else? Like, is there something else you could do to achieve that same result? Again, borrowing from Charles Duhigg's point of like, what reward was your brain after? If your brain was after human connection, maybe you use the phone to call a friend for five minutes. Or maybe if you needed a distraction, you get up, mm-hmm. walk outside, like get a cup of coffee, right? You also might decide that you actually don't want to do anything in that moment. Like there's a real power in giving ourselves a moment of stillness. And you, Mm. I think both have been touching on that as well, but we are just constantly exposing our brains to a fire hose of information and it allows no space for us to have independent creative insights. It's really a problem. So you might decide, I'm just going to, you know what, stare at the elevator lights for five floors (laughs) and not check anything. (laughs) And then finally, you might actually decide you want to be on your phone. And that that segues into the other point I was going to make is that, again, you want to come at this from a point of non-judgment. I think that's where the mindfulness comes in. Mm. I agree with you that just arbitrarily trying to meditate for seven minutes in the morning with no goal is like going to just annoy you. I would hate that too. But if instead it's kind of like, all right, I'm just trying to be aware of how I'm spending my time in each moment, because again, how we pay attention or what we pay attention to will define our lives. So, you know, if you would decide like, I actually, you know what, I'm I'm hungover, I'm tired. I want to just (laughs) zone out for a minute, go for it, but then just make sure that you have the awareness, like set up a system for yourself. So it's like, I'm going to do it for 20 minutes, set a timer, and then I'll stop. And then don't beat yourself up over it. It's, I think, Mm. an attitude of non-judgment that's very important as well. I'm really glad that you brought up this formulation you have of what else, what else could I be spending this time on? And especially figuring out the answer to that by asking why now? Why am I looking at my phone now? Because I was doing exactly what you were describing. I would feel, without even identifying the fact that I was feeling it, like a little pang of sadness or loneliness and then compulsively spend a bunch of time on Instagram or in a dating app, not because it was doing anything for me, but just as a way to like temporarily paper over that, what did you refer to it? The void in the center of my soul. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, A a void of despair, existential emptiness. Yeah, something like that. Abyss would be a word. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're going to rename the podcast Void of Despair, actually. (laughs) Is I really that's a, it's a good good formulation for us, um, and I I found in that first week when we were going cold turkey doing the flip phones I thought it was going to be so hard it became so much easier for me when I kind of incidentally arrived at that formulation and I started when I would go to look at my phone but there was no phone to look at because it's just a flip phone I would call someone which when was the last time you did that or I would even go meet up with someone just you know spur of the moment let's go meet up at a bar at seven o'clock at night which is something I never would have thought to do but was so helpful because it was feeding that why now what was the thing I was looking for in a much more sustainable kind of real way so I'm I'm curious what are the what are the places that people in your experience, have ended up at with figuring out what is the answer for what's the what else that I'm going to fill it with? Right. I think it's a really useful exercise for people to do is just, you know, put your phone away for five minutes, maybe in the other room, and then actually just jot down some, what are the things you say you want to do, but you supposedly don't have time for? Hmm. Because, you know, like before the pandemic, the best stats I could find on phone usage were that the average person was spending four hours a day just on their phones. And if you do that math, that adds up to 60 full days in a year, and it's a quarter of your waking life. Like, that's a lot of time. So we actually do have a lot more time. But you don't have to have these all be huge goals. Like, maybe make some of them be big goals that you actually do want to, I don't know, learn something or, or do something that would be much more of a commitment. But also make sure you add in things you'd like to do in those little moments that you find yourself with, like the five minutes Mm. or the, you know, right before bed. And if you determine that, oh, I used to really enjoy reading, but I don't read anymore, that's great. So then find something you want to read, a newspaper, a magazine, what have you, and put it on your bedside table. And then put your phone in a different room while you're sleeping. 
if you don't take the step to put that Booker magazine on the bedside table, you'll probably be able to resist the phone for the first couple nights out of willpower. But then you're going to be tired. You're going to be hungover, whatever. You're going to go get that phone again. It's going to come back in bed with you. You're going to feel like a failure, which is going to make you want to push away those thoughts even more. And you'll just end up back in your old habits. Instead, if it's like where your phone used to be, there's now a book. It's a reminder that that was what you wanted to do and you've made it easy. Again, you've reduced friction. You don't even have to get out of the bed. So that's something I've seen people actually do with great success is to put something on the bedside table. A lot of people will say I used to journal, you know, but now I just scroll. Mm. So make it easy for yourself. And then you, I think the most beautiful, I mean, for me, the most beautiful impact this book has had on me is just again, like getting me, I mean, it's truly led to me meeting an entirely new community of people who are some of the most important people in my daily life now, because I asked myself what's something I want to do, but I say I don't have time for. And in my case, I was like, I say, I want to learn the guitar. I have a guitar. I played piano since I was a kid. I've never gotten around to learning the guitar. And I ended up signing up for a music class. It was an hour and a half on Wednesday nights. And I ended up just feeling this sense of freedom and letting go and presence um, that I really missed, even though I have a very nice life. And I ended up realizing that the best word to describe that feeling, this sounds like, makes me sound like I was a very unfun person, but it was fun. I was like, I was having fun. <laughs> I was like, whoa, radical concept. What is this feeling? Anyway, long story short, not only did that lead to me writing the book about fun, but it just opened me up to this entirely new world of people with whom I could regularly have human experiences, similar to what you're saying at the bar, but it was, it's mm. a ritualized thing. Like even now, mm. today's Wednesday, mm -hmm. we're talking on, and I am really looking forward to 630 because I go to my guitar class. And I guess what I'm saying is that you... <laughs> Once you start to experiment with what else could you be doing, you might just start with something as simple as reading a couple of paragraphs before bed, but it may lead to a truly life-changing shift in how you yeah. spend your time. And all you need to do is to open yourself up to that possibility and become playfully curious about like, well, what could you experiment with? You know, start mm -hmm. small and see where it leads. But I, I personally have been astonished by how powerful the impact has been on my life of just reevaluating, starting with just reevaluating how I'm interacting with my phone. What do we do when we feel those moments like you were describing, John, where we're like, where we're tired, where we're hungover, which, you know, is a daily problem for you, John, <laughs> as, a, as a huge partier when you're coming back from the nightclub at three in the morning. But it is, those are the hard moments. It's because I, I feel like something that I did at the outset of this, and I think a lot of people do at the outset of like trying to break up with their phone, is the activities we want to fill that with are very aspirational. You know, it's like, I'm going to learn Cantonese. I'm going to learn yeah, how to play the Yeah, that's a bad, that's a harp. horrible idea. Well, <laughs> it's a good language. Like before, but... bed, before bed, you're going to learn Cantonese. That's what I would say to people. Oh, you're totally right. It's like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not happening. But I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, you make a great point about like finding something that you like really want to fill your life with. Like having the guitar practice is great. And it's really important to have that. But I think we do something that I have not yet figured out either is that like, what do I do? And it's like, I got a bad night's sleep. And I came home and I like all I want to do is look at my phone because I feel really crappy and I don't want to do any of my like high minded hobbies. So like, what do I do then to well, you okay. know, not look at the phone? OK, well, you're exhausted and right. you your brain is tired. You don't have the energy to pull out your harp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like dust off so the old harp. I, yeah the phone in that case, you would be using it to self-soothe and because right. you're tired and basically to kill time. So if you're okay with that, and that's what you need in that moment, then that's a possibility. So then I would, yeah. I guess, just ask, is there anything else you could do that would kind of fill that need for you that might not mm. make you feel as gross or hate yourself <laughs> as much as scrolling through something? Like, for example, the one thing I've really tried to do is develop a list of friends who don't think it's incredibly weird if I just call them out of the blue, you know, because mm. it is okay. weird. Yeah. And so maybe you have like your short list of people you could just try. And again, you're using your phone in that moment, but it's for a purpose. Purpose. Maybe there's like, maybe you feel better if you zone out listening to a podcast than you do if you're scrolling through Twitter. And as you've said, mm. like working yourself up and becoming this bad version of yourself. We're all going to have those moments where we're exhausted and we do want to passively consume something or which just feels overwhelming, like you can't get off the couch. So I would try to give yourself like a menu of options there so that you don't have mm. to default to the phone. But at the same time, if you're like, do find yourself on whatever your problematic app is, and it's a little longer than you wanted to be, try not to beat yourself up, right? Like you can't change what you did, but you can say, okay, 
I just caught myself and I don't want to do that again. And instead next time, like make a plan in that moment, next time I'm going to try to, you know, call John and see what crazy party he's at. Something like that. (laughs) I will just say, (laughs) well, so this is very, this is very therapy mindfulness, but uh, you've pointed out that um, just, just stopping and thinking like, why do I need this phone right now? Why do I want this phone right now is useful. And just to let you know how Vegas actually went is we went out Friday <laughs> night. I stayed Saturday night, but I was like, I'm not going out with everyone Saturday night. I can't do this again. Like I'm 42 and have a child. <laughs> Enjoy the club, everyone. I don't and, believe you. You know, so so I went back to my hotel room and I was like, OK, very rare. Just myself in the hotel room. And I sat there and I was like. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> it's just me. Yeah. Relapse it's time. Just, and then I and then I was scrolling through Twitter, and I'm like, why do I want to scroll through Twitter right now? Because mm. I looked at the movies on the on the in the in the, in the hotel room TV, and I was like, that feels scary to me. These movies because they're like disc. I want it, and then I realized I'm like, I want to be connected mm. in the moment now. That's why I'm looking at the news on Twitter, but it's not making me feel great mm. to keep scrolling through the news right now. And then like my friends were like, oh, we're hanging out upstairs before we go out. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get a lot of peer pressure to go out. But I think what I'm looking for is just to connect mm-hmm. with them and to just like yes. connect with someone and talk. So I went upstairs, talked to them for a half hour and was like, all right, now I'm going to bed. Enjoy tonight, guys. Went back downstairs and I was like, and I felt better and, and I went right to sleep. Huh? Yeah. See, that's that I think is a very important story for you to keep in mind when you're thinking about this, because you're never making you remember one of you were referring to the mindfulness as feeling a little bit too soft as mm. a technique. But what you just described is actually exactly the point. And yeah, I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, but that that would not necessarily have happened before you started this challenge. No. Because what you're telling me, yeah, what I'm hearing you say is that you felt the temptation to go to Twitter. You recognize in real time that that was not actually what you were after, that it wasn't going to make you feel good. You asked yourself, what am I actually after? You determined it was connection. You gave yourself an alternative. You enacted, took action on that alternative. And then you went to bed and felt better about yourself. Like, that's a huge success. Yeah, yeah. So you guys thought I was just partying. You won. You <laughs> totally won. <laughs> all right, all right, Disco John. <laughs> I do. I do want to end just by asking one last question because I think it, it's so fascinating how your most recent book, The Power of Fun, is so connected to how to break up with your phone. Mm. Uh, and I do. Th- and we've talked a little bit about this, but I do think, like, figuring out what we want to do with our life instead of looking at our phone mm-hmm. is important. I think the challenge is some people think that you know scrolling is fun or being on their phone is fun like how how do you define fun in the book and um what are what are some of your suggestions about how to have fun which i do think a lot of people have forgotten how to do yeah yeah Yeah, well this is a whole separate conversation too but the so the book is the power of fun and the subtitle is how to feel alive again so that's what my goal was in writing it and what i realized from my own experience and then from doing research by doing a survey of my uh, my mailing list, which by the way, it was, it was contemporaneous with you having your baby. So this was in like summer of 2020. So it's kind of yeah. a weird time to be polling people about fun. But I basically <laughs> asked people to look back on their own lives and call to mind experiences that stood out to them as quote, so fun. The so was capitalized because um, I couldn't think of a better way to phrase that. Yeah. And I said, you know, what were you doing? Who were you with? What made it fun? What objects, if any, were involved? And I collected at this point, I've got mm. thousands of these stories from around the world. My theory was that true fun, as I call it, which is to distinguish it from something I call fake fun. But true fun is the confluence of three states. So it's the confluence of playfulness, connection and flow. And mm. to clarify, by playfulness, I'm not talking about like you have to play games or, you know, God forbid, carry around your phone in a clown case. Like that's not playfulness. <laughs> that's just creepy. It's about having like a lighthearted that's attitude. Right. <laughs> just, uh, it's about having a lighthearted attitude about what you're doing and not ter- caring too much about the outcome. You can still care, but just having a a spirit of like letting down your guard, which actually is very foreign to a lot of adults. Yeah. Mm. So, and connection is the feeling of having this special shared experience. I gave people a list of descriptors and I asked them to check off which ones applied to the stories they told me. And one of the absolute top ones, along with laughter actually, was special shared experience. And laughter, by the way, normally happens when you're with people. And then flow is the state of being totally engaged and present, like actively engaged, not passed out on the couch watching 17 episodes of Netflix, but actively engaged engaged in what you're doing almost to the point where you lose track of time and that is actually totally essential to fun and to my mind it's one of the main problems with our phones is that they're little distraction machines and so if you have your phone 
and you're distracted by it, you are completely blocking the chance that you're going to have fun. You just can't. You can't have Mm. fun and not be present. On the flip side, that means if you are trying to be more present in your life, a shortcut to that is to focus on having more fun. Because when you're having fun, you are present and you don't have to meditate. Um, So anyway, my definition is that it is the, the center of that Venn diagram. It turns fun from this nebulous abstract concept into something that's much more under your control because you basically just focus on building more playfulness into your life, building more connection and building more flow in a large part by reducing distractions. If you achieve any of those three goals, you're already succeeding. And if you happen to get all three at once, like congratulations, you hit the bullseye of true fun. Um, But that's how I define it. And just as a quick, what is the fake fun part? I realize we use the word fun so sloppily in part because we've never defined it. And in part, because there's all these products and services that are marketed to us as fun Mm. uses of our leisure time, social media being the prime culprit here that actually do not result in playful connected flow, and in fact, often make us feel gross about ourselves. The thing I found the most fascinating, I think, about it, about the process of thinking about fun and writing the book is I started to recognize that fun is actually not frivolous at all. We often write it Mm. off as frivolous or think it's even Mm. irresponsible to be adults who prioritize our own fun. But if you actually look at the things fun does for us from, you know, helping us see each other as people instead of political parties, like difference is a race when you're having fun, to some of the actual benefits it has for creativity. You're in an open-minded state, like you have more ideas. But but also the health benefits, like stress and isolation are both really bad for us physically. I mean, isolation is the equivalent of smoking, what, 15 cigarettes a day. But when you have fun, you're socially connected and you're actually in a low stress state. So it's actually really good for us physically. So I don't know, I kind of like, my mind just started to like, I was like blowing my mind to think about how there's this thing we totally write off, but I think it's actually essential to a joyful life. I really like the point that you made about how adults have to learn or relearn a sense of playfulness that is so essential to having fun. And I feel like that really connects back to a point you made at the start of our conversation about how important it is if you're trying to break up with your phone or reset your relationship with your phone to do it with other people, not just for accountability, but to make it fun. And I feel like something that I would really recommend to people who want to try to reset your relationship to your phone is to do it with other people and to make part of your kind of like collective activity and collective mindfulness, trying to find like a new sense of fun or sense of playfulness that you can have with your friends that will replace what you're trying to get from your phone that it's not giving you. Yeah. So start a podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm definitely going to be following. I'm, I'm going to go uh, follow your plan for the next 30 days so mm-hmm. I can uh, have a more sustainable relationship with my phone, break up with my phone, reacquaint myself with um, this this fun thing. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, and can I say I... I put together a kit for your listeners if they actually want to start on that yes sure yes. okay please do yeah i was trying to think of how to actually make that like i'm very into not just talking about stuff but trying to actually help people with it so mm. i have a lot of resources i've made like um you know if people want to try an experiment i recommend people do to like take a 24-hour break from the internet writ large and all your devices which is i know terrifying i created like a preparation guide for that i've got some fun conversation prompts you can use when you're like what the hell do we talk about now that we put our phones away so anyway i made a I phone breakup toolkit for people um Mm. and it also there's also a course where it actually walks people through a phone breakup so if people want to check that out it's at katherineprice.com slash offline um and then i also was going to say i just love to help you guys like if you want to keep going and actually do something where we really try to make this into a sustainable thing i am here i am available i would love to help you and i'm so (laughs) psyched that you're doing this in uh all of our listeners check out the kit that Catherine has put together uh for all of us that's so kind of you uh katherineprice.com slash offline and uh let's uh let's talk more about uh getting us on a on a long-term program here i'm ready uh Sounds thanks wonderful. Catherine. thank you so much 